Hey, so I wanted to say a few words before the release of today's episode with Mary Catherine Hamm analyzing Trump's 2024 agenda, given the events that unfolded over the weekend. I'm in Milwaukee right now covering the Republican National Convention, so we had to pre-record this on Friday, and we, when we did so, we knew that in this volatile race, a lot could change. We underestimated just how dramatically things would change. Liz and I, like everyone, each obviously have thoughts and things that we have to say about the assassination attempt on President Trump. Future episodes will be devoted to that. Um, for now, I'll just echo what I've already been saying on social media, which is that I hope that each of us who talks publicly about politics just takes a moment to reflect on how close we came to an ex mere inches to just an extremely different future for this country uh, and possibly a very dark path was avoided. Um, and we badly need a course correction and we each need to do our part to contribute to that. Um, to I'm thinking hard about the ways in which we stage these conversations, the way issues are framed, um, ways we can contribute to a healthier discourse, uh, and ultimately a healthier and more resilient American culture. I think I'll have a lot more specifics to get on into that uh, in the future. But for now, I just want to share a little bit on a meta level how I'm thinking about that going forward. And the reason I feel okay about releasing today's episode with Mary Catherine is that I think we actually hit a lot of those themes and kind of set the kind of tone that I would like to see going forward. We talk about substance of policy for a second term in the Trump presidency, but there's also a section where Liz and Mary Catherine in particularly reflect on how we move past vengeance and retribution towards something higher. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy our episode with Mary Catherine Ham. Biden is not a candidate that I think is capable of turning around an election. So I think this is Trump's to lose. I think there's a point of diminishing returns where you throw so many legal issues at him that people go, I'm just not either interested or buying this. This is a thing I had to admit I was wrong about, in particular to my father, because uh, I was like, you can't listen to this man say he's going to appoint good people to the Supreme Court. He, he does he does exactly what he wants. He'll probably appoint one of his relatives. And uh, I was wrong. He picked pretty well. And that transaction worked out for social conservatives. Uh, so there are things that could work out for libertarians. This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. Where does Donald Trump want to take this country? Just asking questions. As the GOP coronates Trump as its presidential nominee at the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, there will be a lot of talk about Trump's vice presidential pick, his dominance in the polls, and the decline of Joe Biden. But what about policy? What is the Trump agenda? Trump's opponents implore us to fear Project 2025 a Heritage Foundation proposal, which they characterize as a vengeful authoritarian power grab. Trump himself waves that away and tends to focus more on his plans to levy tariffs on foreign goods, deporting illegal immigrants, and yes, finally building that wall. Neither Trump nor the Democrats seem interested in talking much at all about our soon to be $35 trillion national debt, which has eclipsed our total national GDP for the first time since World War II. So to help us analyze and anticipate what an increasingly likely second Trump term might look like and to help explain how the hell Trump 2024 is even possible, all things considered, 
we've invited Mary Catherine Hamm, a conservative political journalist and commentator at Fox News, and on her own podcast, Getting Hammered. We wanted to talk with her because she's Trump critical, but also understands the conservative mind and movement as someone who's been immersed in it for years. Mary Catherine, thanks for joining us. So we're taping this the Friday before convention week because I'm going to be at the convention shooting interviews all next week. So let's caveat all of this to note that a lot could change in the next several days. The political earthquake that was the first presidential debate is still reverberating, but there's no doubt that the Democrats are in a very bad polling position right now. Uh, my understanding is that the 2020 election really came down to the suburbs. Uh, here's some data from the uh, Brookings Institution that, uh, let's go to this next slide, uh, shows that basically Democrats always win the cities, Republicans win the rural parts of the country, and the suburbs are the kind of toss-up territory. Uh, in 2016 and 2012, Republicans won that by two and three points uh, respectively. And then in 2020, Biden, at least according to this Brookings analysis, got you know had a one point advantage in the suburbs. So I guess my first question for you, uh, Mary Catherine, is is that in the context of 2024, what are some of the top issues for winning that key suburban vote? Well, yeah, I I, look at it. It will be important. uh, And I think particularly in the color counties of Pennsylvania, because no matter uh, Biden at this point has, I believe, one path to 270. And it goes through Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Okay, you got to get all of those. So I think the collar counties of Philadelphia are going to be important. Those Bucks County, Delco, that kind of area. And um, that requires a lighter touch. It requires a bit of moderation. It requires things that, frankly, Trump is not great at. However, Uh in the last, and again, as you note with uh, the news cycle, plenty can change and Trump could revert to form uh, the second after I say this, and I anticipate that he will shortly. But in the past couple of weeks, he's been rather quiet as uh, Biden's campaign has gone through this melodrama. Um, He has done some things to moderate the Republican Party's platform, particularly on social issues, which a lot of pro-life voters are not excited about. Um, But I've always noted one of my arguments against Trump from the beginning in 2015 was this man doesn't have the same beliefs as I do. Right. He does he, on many things, tariffs, on entitlements, on the debt, <laughs> on some social issues. We're not in the same place. Uh, but that is a move that could appeal to those type of voters. There's a there's a model for this, which is Glenn Youngkin in Virginia. But Glenn Youngkin in Virginia is a very different character from Trump. And even yeah. if you do the policy moves toward a more moderate uh, pitch, if you put off all these voters with your personality, uh, you won't be bringing them in. Youngkin was a uh, friendly, sort of polished, sounded like a smart, non-threatening guy, wore a fleece vest, uh, and importantly noted that for suburban women, school might be an important thing, which Democrats had sort of given up on during COVID, uh, and schools in Northern Virginia in particular were closed for uh, more than 18 months to, to students and longer than that for regular weeks. Uh, so he was speaking to things that they actually cared about in a really problematic scenario. That doesn't mean that Trump it, can't appeal to them again with maybe a vice presidential pick that looks more like a Youngkin uh, than he does. But a funny thing that I heard from uh, from people during the primary about Haley voters was uh, from Trump supporters was like, well, these are just Democrats crossing over and voting for Haley. And I would say, you know what? They are Democrats. A lot of them are Democrats who are women who used to be Republicans. And you might want to think about talking to them. Um, so those are the folks you you do have to woo. So how would a Vance vice presidential pick for Trump change the game here and or help him lock down Pennsylvania? So I'm a little skeptical about that. Uh, Vance is a new political figure, uh, relatively inexperienced. He is a very smart person. Um, and yet 
he ran some 19 points behind the Republican gubernatorial candidate, who is now the governor, DeWine, uh, mm -hmm. in Ohio when he won that Senate seat, uh, suggesting that maybe he didn't have his finger on the pulse and that people were not buying the product he was pitching in the same way that they were from other Republicans in that state. Um, he does have an Appalachian pedigree, which we all know about, thanks to Hillbilly Elegy. Um, I think he's well-spoken. I do not agree with him on policy. And one of my hopes is that many people say uh, that if he picked Vance, Trump is trying to uh, pass down to reform the party by creating this younger version of a more populist policy. And in fact, I think Vance being a bit smarter about policy and more interested in policy might be more effective at that. And I hope Trump doesn't care about that because I don't want a tariff world, <laughs> right? I think, I think, uh, I think that wouldn't go well. But I'm, I'm also more interested in economic policy than a lot of suburban moms are, right? Um, so I am not. That's a very super... not like other girls line. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to say I, I always joke that I'm normie adjacent. I'm not actually <laughs> normal, but I. I come a little closer to it than than some in Washington. I also but, uh, identify as an anti-tariff wine mom, so like I'm right here with see, you. See, this is what I'm saying. <laughs> we need t-shirts. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm not bought in on the idea that he does do a lot to appeal. I think Trump does plenty of that appeal by himself uh, and has mm -hmm. a personality and policies that speak to many in those regions and that his weakness is actually more the Yunkin Burgum type of character. Uh, as opposed to that. But for for the normie suburban vote, um, I mean, my model, mental model of that, and now I'm living among them. I wasn't in 2020, but now I am not only living on them, I'm becoming one. And it seems to be like a, sort of a, a desire for a, like being like placid, normal, non-chaotic, yes. all these traits that are the opposite of Trump. And maybe in 2020, Biden kind of represented that. Is it because of his decline now, his, his very visible mental and physical decline that it's just like along the kind of like non-chaotic access that it's a toss up and that that's what's causing this I, this change? I, yeah. I do think that's it. I think, I think a lot of people understandably looked at Biden versus Trump and thought, OK, I'm not excited about Biden, but he seems like a return to sort of a normal statesman like kind of figure um, and that that will be a little calmer. And that's something that I can be OK with. And then I think one of his first missteps was in 2021, not declaring victory over the pandemic, like the vaccines had gone out right in summer of 2021. He's like, actually, no, we're all going to mask back up. I think that yep. really took the wind out of their sails immediately for the pandemic. And we're going to impose a uh, federal workforce. Right. Like we're going to use OSHA to make everyone who's employed at a large company get a vaccine. Right. Like the like the the excess and and of course like like the uh, the spending that happened that that you know poured fuel on the inflation fire. All that stuff could have been avoided if, as you say, he had just kind of yeah, just declared take, take victory. Take the W. Take the W. Take the w. Uh, Move on. You know. Yeah. Um, we've moved through this this moment and the pitch, if it's normalcy, none of that felt like normalcy. And it, in yep. fact, uh, you know, exacerbated things that were not normal supply chain issues, inflation, all of all those things, which if you are a suburban mom just trying to get dino nuggets, then <laughs> in formula, which I happen to be at the time, uh, those things bother you. Right. So I think that the call is much more even now about who might be yeah. more chaotic because you look at Trump's personality and you go, well, I'm not enjoying that. Um, voters are absolutely crying out for somebody to act normal for five minutes. And Trump is like, uh, would you rather buy, die by shark or electrocution? And Biden <laughs> is like, my uncle was eaten by cannibals. Like these are not <laughs> normal people. Um, yeah. And so I think a lot of people more than more than many in media and many in Washington understand a lot of people understand that these are two bad choices. These are two how, not good what, choices. How does then, the, like, what about the role? Oh, sorry, Liz, go ahead. Well, how does the abortion issue play in this election? I mean, I'm thinking about how a lot of people, I mean, I think both you and I, Mary Catherine, are extremely pro-life. Uh, Zach is more on the pro-choice side of the spectrum, like a good libertarian reason employee. Good job, Zach. Um, 
But a lot of people are really not partisans um, who lean too far in either direction. Most people are not radicals on this issue. Most people are frankly not especially principled on this issue. There is a strong sense polling data indicates that first trimester abortion tends to be very widely accepted in this country. Second trimester, people feel a little ickier about. Third trimester, okay, no, enough. The buck stops there for most people, right? Um, but we also have this sort of weird Trump position where he is responsible for appointing conservative Supreme Court justices that did overturn Roe and made Dobbs the law of the land, returning the issue to the states. But also at the same time that this is happening, Trump himself, in all of his uh, sound bites and speeches, is not particularly princi like a particularly principled pro-lifer. And then we just saw this past week uh, the Republican platform really, really changing the way that it handles abortion and talks about it. How is this likely to play with the demographic that you're talking about? Yeah, I I think this is tricky, right? And I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm with you, Liz, that I don't agree with Trump on the life issue, but he's like this is very Trumpy, right? He's a trans yeah. transactional guy, and he's a moderate, and he's a moderate on this issue, and he says, okay, look, I did the thing, I got the Supreme Court justices. I actually didn't think his debate answer on this was bad at all because he says the Supreme no. Court justices they ruled on this, uh, it's sent back to the states. You can figure it out in the states. And I would note that in two separate states, I was surprised he knew this uh, detail, that he noted two states where uh, rules had been liberalized post Dobbs, yeah. right? Um, so he's sort of shielding himself from the from the charge that he's way on the right uh, on this issue. Now, that's going to make some pro-lifers mad. Do I think he will lose their votes? No, I do not. So uh, he also noted that he that he endorses exceptions at the end of that answer. So I just thought it was like he hit a couple of decent pitches to this demographic. Now, whether this demographic is willing to listen to him is a whole other issue. I think if you take the Youngkin model again, Youngkin was very consistent and very disciplined about saying 15 weeks is the, the area that we are talking about regulating, right? And that is something that even I think a majority of women look at second trimester is like, okay, we can put some restrictions in place here. So he's on safe ground, but he was very disciplined. The entire Republican Party in Virginia was very disciplined about sticking with that number and repeating it over and over again, because I think what becomes difficult is that you have to um, have this conversation about trimesters, right? It's not as easy as just saying pro-life or pro-choice. And that is a tougher, more delicate conversation to have. It's tougher to message consistently. And Donald Trump is famously not great at messaging consistently or delicately. Um, and then the final thing is, the less you just sound like a jerk talking about these things, the better off you're going to be. And uh, yeah. obviously, there are other people who are better at not sounding like a jerk than Donald Trump is. Uh, but in this case, like I don't, his heart is not in a super pro-life position uh, or a super religious position, which is sort of the the boogeyman here that scares off a suburban woman voter. Yeah. He's yeah, in an interesting as, position because like pro-lifers like me feel somewhat satiated, I suppose, by the um, ruling in Dobbs, which we can draw a pretty direct line to Trump's appointment of conservative yeah. justices like Amy Coney Barrett <laughs> and see the Dobbs decision uh, as very obviously stemming from that, where it just like simply would not have happened had a Democrat been in office yep. uh, during that time. But also Trump is able to really like like in terms of how he messages, in terms of the types of things he says, he really doesn't remind me of any pro-lifer that I know in right. any way really at all. But let me speak to the other side of that being the moderately pro-choice person in the conversation. I agree with what Mary Catherine is saying that the messages that Trump has put out about this also satiate me as someone who, you know, doesn't think that there should be zero choice in this matter down to the first trimester, but also uh, likes federalism. Um, like I'm like the 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 strange, like moderately pro-choice, pro-federalist, pro-Dobbs ruling right. person. And this is like he's hitting right in that zone for me. Um, so I think like you're right that in general on this, like the impossible issue in American politics, Trump is somehow like walking that tightrope. He has a I am strange curious. ability to do that sometimes. <laughs> I am curious on like the uh, just like one more question on like the the normie voter mindset. Like, yeah. why is that? Why are the felony convictions and the other 
legal problems that are still hanging over his head uh, in Georgia. Is that kind of just not on front of, in front of mind anymore? Like, why is that not a bigger turnoff in this demographic? If I am to use my uh, little focus group of friends who are largely military moms um, who have very busy lives taking care of their kids and taking care of a lot of other things, they're, they're not paying a lot of attention to the election per se. And they certainly are not paying attention to every single legal story about Donald Trump, among which I have trouble distinguishing at times because even, this is my full time job and keeping track of the things that he's facing uh, becomes very difficult and complicated for me. So I think there's a point at which there is so much that a lot of people's brains go. Yeah, I thought he was kind of a crook. I still think he's kind of a crook. He seems mm -hmm. like a jerk, not a great guy. Um, we'll see what happens here. I also think there's a possibility that a lot of people don't distinguish between <laughs> a flood of news stories about indictments and a flood of news stories about convictions. And they just hear he was convicted and they go, did that already happen like a year ago? I, I truly think that might be some of it, that people aren't digesting each part of this story. Uh, and there is a, I think there's a point of diminishing returns where you throw so many legal issues at him that people go, yeah, I'm just not either interested or buying this at this point. He uh, so Trump also has been trying to explicitly court libertarians, of which Liz and I are part of that voting demographic. And I was at the LNC when he made that very explicit pitch to a very rowdy, raucous group of libertarians. I want to play that clip just to remind people uh, how that all went down and then talk a little bit about will Trump win some of the libertarian vote this year? Well, in the last year, I've been indicted by the government on 91 different things. So if I wasn't a libertarian before, I sure as hell am a libertarian now. <laughs> And if you vote for me on day one, I will commute the sentence of Ross Ulbricht to a sentence of time, sir. I'm committing to you tonight that I will put a libertarian in my cabinet and also libertarians in senior posts. So I... I am not planning to vote for Donald Trump, even though uh, I appreciate that he actually came and made a pitch to libertarians. Yeah. Bi Biden didn't do that. And I think it will win him goodwill. We'll talk a little bit later about some of my reasons for still having not being able to make, take the plunge. But um, I do think that him just making the effort, uh, giving libertarians a little bit of attention uh, is going to move the needle a little bit. And he is dangling some specific pieces of meat out there. I uh, hate to talk about Ross Ulbricht that way. Like he de he deserves to be right. uh, out of prison, in my opinion. And uh, it would be great to get a libertarian in the cabinet. But uh, Liz, w any thoughts on the libertarian vote in Trump this year? From me? Yeah. I mean, it's pretty it felt i mean exactly like what trump does the best right he's just coming into a room full of people and he's totally pandering to them uh and it's not clear to me why libertarians would a give him uh the prime time spot on their stage if i were the libertarian uh nominee for president i would probably feel a little insulted by this uh so insulted that i might in fact just consume some edibles which is what their uh one of their candidates did to deal with this slight um, but I mean, why do we believe that Trump, a man who is notoriously uh, unpredictable and, and unreliable, is actually going to stick to his promises with regard to putting a libertarian in his cabinet? I mean, I just I don't really buy it. I am happy to be proven wrong on this front. But I mean, if you buy it, I think you're pretty gullible. Yeah, pr proceed with caution. Uh, one, yeah. I would like that ungovernable uh, graffiti <laughs> banner to put over my kids' cribs. Um <laughs> Just for like truth and advertising to uh, <laughs> Gary Johnson, head of the Department of the Interior. I'm um, just let's just go for it. Big nature. You definitely guy. don't want him in a foreign policy position, given his sort of geographic confusion. Um, and then I think this is the thing that I actually like about Trump is that, um, you know, he heard Ross's name probably like two seconds before he went out on the stage. And it's like, what's with the signs? OK, let's just do that. Uh, 
this can actually be helpful because I think pardons are an important power of the president and that they should be deployed more often and that people shouldn't worry about the political consequences of them so, so much and overthink it that you don't do any of anything with this power. Um, so the idea that you can just walk into a room with Trump and be like, hey, like maybe we should free this guy. I, li- I like that about him. Um, and Democrats, frankly, should have taken more advantage of that part of Trump. You can just walk into a room and be the last person who says something about a policy. And he's like, maybe. But that also means that he's not at all libertarian because he doesn't have a belief system. Uh, I appreciate that his personal run in with the criminal justice system is uh, is helping him to think through these matters. But I don't know that it will translate uh, to policy. Trump's oh, lived experience is yes. slowly but surely turning him over to um, But yeah, I think it's important to make a pitch to different communities, right? And uh, your mileage may vary on how much you trust him. Uh, we just talked about social conservatives who got, frankly, a lot that they wanted out of those three uh, choices for Supreme Court justice. This is a thing I had to admit I was wrong about, in particular to my father, because uh, I was like, you can't listen to this man say he's going to appoint good people to the Supreme Court. He, he does he does exactly what he wants. He'll probably appoint one of his relatives. And uh, I was wrong. He picked pretty well. And that transaction worked out for social conservatives. Uh, so there are things that could work out for libertarians. Um, he, he does not suffer from the same sort of paralysis about going outside the box that some other candidates do. Whether that ends up good or bad, it's yet to be seen. Well, you know, beyond Trump, there has been a pretty concerted effort to try to fold libertarians or some libertarians, at least a little bit more into the Trump movement or the modern version of the Republican Party, um, which has moved in a different direction with foreign policy, which is more in keeping with how libertarians think about foreign policy. Vivek Ramaswamy was at this convention as well. He's liked by a certain type of libertarian talking about a libertarian nationalist alliance, which I see as a little bit of a contradiction, but I guess maybe uh, it resonates with with some libertarians. Do you think that this sort of, you know, fusion 2.0 is going to have a lasting effect on like the future of the conservative movement? Yeah, I'm not sure. Again, because uh, Trump is such a mercurial leader uh, and what he believes or what he does changes pretty frequently. I do think that the foreign policy of the Trump years, uh, I, I've gone from hawkish to hawkish-ish over the years, right? Because I think we've all learned lessons uh, over the past 20 years. And I think a lot of America has has made that move as well. So it's not a pitch that people are uncomfortable with. Um, and Trump's version of like, hey, I'm going to be a little unpredictable so that uh, adversaries are kind of scared of me. Uh, I'm going to occasionally show some bellicosity, taking out Soleimani, but not commit a bunch of troops to the ground. Um, it's a pitch that a lot of Americans like, and they don't have to be ideological. They're just people who've been burned by some of the last 20 years of nation building and have perhaps been part of families where people have been deployed many, many times, right? So I think that the, that now I don't know how well the, the fusion of the actual ideological libertarians and nationalists works, right? The power is in, I think, appealing to normal voters with this, uh, this pitch, because there's so much of the, a particularly young conservative movement that is going to turn off libertarians and frankly turns me off with a sort of, and a sometimes understandable desire to use government power against the people who have used it against you, right? And to ratchet up and say, well, like, if they can tell me not to go to Applebee's for two years, then surely there's something that Trump can do to them to uh, to keep them from doing these bad things in the future. So I I, I don't think that's, that's a match made in heaven uh, between the Trump coalition and libertarians. And that's what rubs me the wrong way often about uh, some of these more populist movements. Yes. Now you're starting to get more into the territory of what is makes me uncomfortable about a second Trump term. Um, I mean, the, the concrete issue that is most concerning to me, this is kind of a wash either way, but I teased it in the introduction, the national debt. Um, this is where we are right now uh, with gross federal debt as a percentage of gross domestic product. 
um, we're it's at 122 um, percent of the entire economy. That's our federal debt. Um, it, it's higher than it was at its peak, which was at the end of World War II. Um, and unlike then, there doesn't seem to be any appetite to for cutting spending. And you know, to look at Trump's uh, contribution to this, I've you know created this little highlight here. This is Trump's debt. You see that enormous spike that happened due to the pandemic, which he's always quick to point out. Well, I had to spend a bunch of money because of the pandemic, which uh, we can debate whether that much money had to be spent or not. But then even before the pandemic, you see it's just a steady, no matter who's in charge, it's just just going up and up and up. And I am not at all optimistic that Trump is going to have the focus to do anything about that. That doesn't seem to be on his agenda. It doesn't seem to be part of Agenda 47. Uh, and in fact, some of his policies, his nationalist policies, the tariffs that you mentioned, the uh, immigration restrictions, you know, restricting the labor market would, to me, seem to worsen that picture if we're hoping that a uh, rising GDP is going to somehow magically get right. us out of this mess. Yeah, this is one of those things that we're lonely in our concern about. Uh, and frankly, I, on, when, I, when I used to be on CNN, when we would do anything about spending or debt, I would just be like, hi, I know nobody cares about this, but we're actually headed in a really bad direction and money cannot be treated as fake for the next several decades and expect everybody to come out okay. But there's where we go back to regular voters. Regular voters don't care about the debt, right? And I, I will never hate on George W. Bush for attempting to reform Social Security to some extent, even though that crashed and burned. Uh, I will never hate on Romney and Ryan for trying to talk about entitlements during a presidential run, which actually didn't have that many bad effects. I think they were just destined to lose to Obama regardless. Um, and I think those were missed opportunities where we could have taken a turn to make things better. But... Uh, and Liz, I feel like I, I feel like you mentioned this the other day. I feel like this is the marshmallow test of politicians and nations, right? Where we cannot understand that something worse is coming. If we like, this is an immediate gratification thing. We're just taking what we can get as long as we can get it. Each generation is sort of happy to do that and saying, well, if these guys get handouts and these guys get this, why wouldn't I get this? Um, adjustments are very painful. And I think making that political case is very, very hard. And no one has the appetite for it. So then the question becomes, in that scenario, is Trump worse vis-a-vis -vis or compared to Biden? And I'm I'm not sure. <laughs> By the way, can I also say, maybe you wouldn't have had to do so much pandemic spending if people had thought critically about what the economic consequences would have been of shutting everything down. It. So one of the things that keeps coming to mind as you're talking is like this through line of between many of the things you're saying of like, are we sort of in a post ideology or like post conservative, like as, as we typically as as the three of us think of conservative and, and the sort of basket of assumptions and principles and beliefs that come along with that. A lot of the things that you're talking about, like lack of interest in entitlements, lack of interest in debt and deficit, um, maybe hawkishness, uh, but a sense of like, OK, we need to not anti-war in the way that I think um, Zach would identify with, but a little bit more of a pulled back restrained foreign policy. I mean, and then like moderation on social issues, moderation on abortion, moderation on gay marriage. OK, maybe not like loving the transing of the kids in the schools, but like definitely trying to like be respectful to your neighbors, that type of thing. Like all of this strikes me as like representative of what so many suburban and frankly, probably some rural voters feel represents them, but it's not conservative. It's not really liberal either. Like it's not progressive. Absolutely not. But like, are, are we in a post-conservative moment or do we have a new term to describe this bundle of beliefs? Yeah. I, I don't know that there's a term for it. And I, I think one of the mistakes I made in 2015 and 16 is assuming too often that people did have a slate of beliefs that they stayed consistent about, right? To, to me, it means so much because what do I build my, my thoughts about any 
policy on if I don't have a set of beliefs to which I adhere and a, a role that I think the government is appropriate in. But uh, I had to learn the hard way that, <laughs> that many voters who I thought were sort of on board with all of these things didn't really care about them and uh, that they were not invested in this slate of beliefs. And that, in fact, the fact that the whole crew of folks who ran against Trump in 2016, remember, like it was they were sort of vaunted as as up and comers and smart. And many of them were accomplished and many of them were smart and could speak about policy. And the answer that voters gave was we're not interested in what you're selling us even if you're selling it to us in a smart, decent package. Um, and I think that was a hard lesson for me to learn, and I'm not sure what it means for politics at large. It could just mean that elites were better at corralling all of the normal people into their system of beliefs uh, and have become less good at doing so. I mean, there's always been populism. There's always been people who are not ideological people. And uh, frankly, most of the normal people I know are not ideological people. They are people who look around and go, can y'all please stop acting weird? This is the level of weird I'm allowed, I'm I'm able to accept while I'm living my life. And like you said, like transing the kids might go too far for me. But a six-week abortion ban might also go too far for me, right? That's, and that's where most of my normal friends who are not engaged in politics live their lives. And that is closer to a Trump pitch than it is a Biden pitch. Okay. I think that one consequence of moving past this past small C conservatism is a sort of leaving behind the I, the belief in limited government or uh, any restraints on power whatsoever. And it's more about we have to use the power before they use the power. And I see 2024 hurtling towards that. Uh, that 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 is one of the things that is most concerning to me about a second Trump term. Um, there is this boogeyman we've heard a lot about from the Democrats, especially after Biden's devastating debate, Project 2025. And what like when I say boogeyman, I'm not even actually trying to be dismissive. It might actually be really bad from a libertarian perspective. But what I want to tease out here is like just how scary is this thing we keep hearing about now, Project 2025? We've got a clip from MSNBC's Joy Reid giving the progressive characterization of this document and the agenda. Uh, let's roll that. The Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 saying they're going to expand presidential power to confirm John Roberts' uh, edict that the president is a king. The idea that they're going to just deconstruct the administrative state, meaning putting 50,000 civil servants on the street unemployed. They're going to reverse the FDA approval of abortion medication, condemning women in blue states to also an abortion ban. They're going to reverse the interpretation of the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act, meaning women will die in the emergency room if they need abortion care. They'll block gender-affirming health care so parents don't decide what to do with their own own children, they decide. They'll eliminate the EPA enforcement office, meaning we will choke on smog because the Koch brothers want. They'll dismantle the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, meaning we won't know when a hurricane is coming. Beryl is literally going to where my godmother is in Jamaica. They will eliminate the Department of Education. I could go on, Sherilyn. Okay. Uh, so to be honest, uh, some of that sounds pretty good from a libertarian perspective. <laughs> well, you <laughs> don't want to be warned about hurricanes, Zach? Mm -hmm. Do you want to live in Yeah, well, there's, the there's no way we're going to know when a hurricane's coming uh, without a federal agent. But <laughs> like, when we're the talking about... That's what I have to do, Zach. Who will build the roads? <laughs> like, when we're talking about, you know, cutting down the federal bureaucracy to size yeah. and devolving some of this power to the states, that's what the consequence of those sort of moves would be. And I think that would be a good thing. I want to see a more Javier Malay type uh, approach to these things uh, uh, sooner rather than later, uh, sooner before we get to the hyperinflation situation that Argentina was facing. Yeah. But like, uh, I, you know, of course, the I think the federal government making medical decisions for people isn't a good idea. So I, I don't like that. But like what I am most concerned about in here and Joy Reid is push is pointing to some of this is the expansion of federal authority, which right. we we, I want to get into the documents itself a little bit in a second, but first, I'd just love to get your initial thoughts on the Project 2025 discourse. Yeah. Well, first, I believe it's like a 900-page document, so I am not yeah. well-versed in all parts of it. Um, I will say that <laughs> the, the characterizations of it uh, can get a little insane, and insane to the point that I feel like 
uh, it becomes one of these uh, buzzwords that's meant to keep you from actually talking about the substance of the policy, right? It's just, it's supposed to be so scary that this is out of bounds to ever consider. And in fact, what it is, look, Heritage Foundation has changed a lot since they began doing this, but the Heritage Foundation has always offered an incoming Republican administration since 1980, a big old binder full of ideas about a bunch of things. Now, shout out to old boring Heritage Foundation, which called it the mandate for leadership, which is much less catchy. And I'm sure some younger staffer was like, this time we're going to call it Project 2025. And I would say that was a mistake because <laughs> because catchy can also sound like a little scarier, right? Mandate for leadership doesn't sound that scary. So let's, I just wanted to contextualize that a little yep. bit because that's what this document is. It is the current version of the mandate for leadership that Ed Fulner handed to Reagan back in the day. Um, also, we have no assurance that Trump is even necessarily going to be using every single component of this, or right? Like this get is it something done. that's a little bit, right. yeah. Like this is something that's a little bit ginned up. I feel like where it's like the, oh. this document exists. Mm-hmm. This president seems ever more likely to win, but we don't necessarily like. There's a bunch of other components to actually getting these 900 pages enacted that seem to be like yeah. the details seem to be kind of lost on people like Joy Reid. It's like they're so in such a hurry to jump into this like fomenting panic and hysteria. Yes. And I I probably I would put my good money on the fact that I dislike a ton of this plan. However, as a person who cares about policy, I don't mind Trump getting a slate of policies thought through, put in front of him that he could then think through. Right. That having a plan for an incoming administration of some sort that some people have thought through is not a terrible idea. <laughs> and I think the contrast too here between <laughs> him and like Joe Biden, I haven't really heard so much right. about what the next four years <laughs> are going to look like if he gets his way and is alive <laughs> then as well. Yeah. Like, like there's obviously a bunch of different things that must be put into place and it's looking ever more likely that the Biden campaign um, may be seeing some massive shakeup sometime <laughs> soon. But like, at least with this, some of the focus is on like what actual policies would exist under the Trump years, as opposed to like, it's kind of shocking to me how little policy emphasis there has been from Team Biden so far. Yeah. And I I think the this is one of these incentive problems we have in politics, right, is that once you put ideas to paper and say these are policies we're considering, everyone can tear your policy ideas apart. It's something that Trump sort of avoids by not really thinking about policy or but but I prefer to have a policy discussion. Um, That being said, he's already I think he's already sort of he disavowed this pretty strongly, despite the fact that uh, people from his last administration are involved with it. I'm sure he will have like a friendly ear to some of the ideas inside it. But I do think it's being blown up into like a such a such a panicky thing that I'm not sure people will buy it it just sounds like oh the project 25 2025 is going to turn you into handmaid's tale and i just don't know how much people buy that these days they've tried that so many times well here here's the part that concerns me um it's that heritage foundation i think has always believed in a strong executive uh authority centralized executive power in a way that libertarians don't um and that is very present in this document. Um, and uh, it's something that I could imagine uh, Trump implementing because the inability to kind of get his agenda through the bureaucracy last time was a major problem for him. And one that seems to be like top of mind. Um, this is from the overview. Uh, they mentioned the popular phrase personnel is policy. Um, and say that the president's appointment, direction, and removal authorities are central elements of his executive power. Um, the, the desire to infiltrate political appointees improperly into the high career civil service has been widespread in every administration, whether Democrat or Republican. Democratic administrations, however, are typically more successful. Uh, and then they go on to describe some of these career bureaucrats as as burrowing in these very ideological uh appointees who uh the the democrats have been very good at you know getting getting them in there into the deep state and then they can never be dislodged 
And so this is really like the, the drain the swamp plan put into action, right? Um, and they talk about uh, this uh, Schedule F, which is a component of an executive order that Trump uh, passed that allowed the president to dismiss some of these uh, th these career bureaucrats if they're not doing what he wants them to do. And then that was rescinded by Biden. And so that is one of the uh, central components of, of this plan. Um, it's it's inarguably that they inarguable to me that they definitely want to give Trump the power to clear out personnel he doesn't like and staff up with the bureaucracy, probably with his loyalists. And that seems kind of bad, especially when you pair it with what's been published by one of his one of his former assistant AGs, Jeff Clark, under this title. The U.S. Justice Department is not independent. Um, and he, Clark, argues, again, this is someone who worked for Trump before, that the executive branch of the federal government was designed to be unitary. In other words, the president is the sole head of the executive branch. All executive branch officials ultimately report to him and thus can and should be removable by him. The ex external legal constraints on their conduct do not mean that these officials out of necessity must be freed of the meta constraint of heeding the leadership of the president on pain of facing removal from office and replacement by an official who will obey the president. Um, this is disturbing language to me, but what do you think about kind of the plan to drain the swamp? Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm going to quote Trump and say, I'm just now hearing this for the first time. Um, but no, as I have not read through all of these ideas, but uh, my first question would be, how many bureaucrats are we looking at getting rid of? Because uh, that does sound sort of appealing to me. And then the other part of it is uh, when the Trump, if if Trump aligned folks are saying you that they had less success than the left in installing people in the federal government, um, that's certainly true. That was partly because Trump would bottleneck everything and required loyalists uh, who had never tweeted a bad thing about him at some point uh, to be put into these slots, which means they couldn't staff up uh, to a, a great degree. Um, so I don't know if I if I got a situation where we could knock out a lot of career bureaucrats and then Trump was unable to get enough loyalists to fill those slots. That might be a net win for me. I don't know. Um I'm just yeah, spitballing the, here. Yeah, no, no. A, a bet on the uh, incompetence to actually execute the plan resulting in a net reduction in the bureaucracy. Like that, I guess that's one bet we could that, make. Just, um, just, a, just a one way to think about it. Um, on the Justice Department front, I think, and this is, this is you could run into the problem of a, a choice between two bad choices, right? Because uh, my concern level about the Justice, Justice Department already being politicized to a very problematic degree is so high that I can't get so panicked about this. I mean, I think in particular, um, just the Russiagate nonsense for, for four years was an, a, a huge abuse of power in many areas of the government, particularly intelligence communities, intelligence officials, uh, and law, law enforcement agencies working with the media to create this story that didn't end up being a real thing. Um, and it was perhaps an abuse of power worse than most of the things Trump imagines <laughs> and uh no one has been held accountable for it so while i'm not sure i'd trust the trump administration to do the proper holding of accountable of people um uh, without going overboard i am also not satisfied with the status quo so i think that's that's no, where i think I that, that that's fair um i guess what what i worry is it, it's that continuing cycle or ratcheting up where each side is expanding the power and then just handing it back to the other side and then they're expanding it and handing it back and what we're like the the rumblings that trump's allies are making about what they want to do with this power this this uh control over the justice department is that's probably the the biggest concern for me like that trump 2024 is going to be about vengeance and that the quest for vengeance is going to trample on the rule of law and uh, there's we've got a couple examples of 
some of his surrogates or people surrounding him who've, who've made some of these noises that I want to play and, and get your reaction to. I'm sure you've already heard some of them. One is Kevin Roberts, the Heritage Foundation president that, that oversaw the creation of this document, calling for a second American revolution on Steve Bannon's podcast. Uh, John, could you roll that clip? Let me speak about the radical left. You and I have both been parts of faculties and faculty senates and understand that the left has taken over our institutions. The reason that they are apoplectic right now, the reason that so many anchors on MSNBC, for example, are losing their minds daily is because our side is winning. And so I come full circle on this response and just want to encourage you with some substance that we are in the process of the second American revolution, which will remain bloodless if the left allows it to be. Okay, ominous. Uh, and then we've actually got Steve Bannon himself a few days before reporting to prison using similar language on Tucker Carlson's show. John, could you run that one? You're now being betrayed and persecuted by your country. There's no, no fair person could, I don't think, could conclude anything but that. Not, 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 not our country, Tucker. That. No, our country, our, con our country, the guys that listen to you and support you. We're being we're being suppressed by we're being oppressed by an illegitimate regime yes. that usurp power here. And that's what we have to break. We see McCabe on TV wetting himself every night about, oh, when these people get back in power, they're going to come after us. You're damn right. We're going to come after you within the rule of law, because that's how we'll bequeath a constitutional republic to our children and grandchildren. OK, so it's like they're always careful to say, you know, within the rule of law and so forth, but it right. doesn't exactly put my mind at ease. And it, neither does the fact actually that Trump himself, like he has kind of toned down that rhetoric a bit, yeah, especially a little bit. in the debate. But I don't know. Am I wrong to be concerned about this feeling that there's some sort of vengeance quest going on here? I don't think you're wrong to be concerned. I think that... Um... Trump's attention span for such things uh, makes me less concerned about it. Yeah. The fact that he notably did not jail Hillary Clinton, I think, is important. That's an important data point. Um, oh, now, the other folks who work for him and the, the more Bannon-like voices, I think, do have more dedication to that notion. So th that would be where my concern is. I think that uh, one of my concerns about a Trump 2024 win yeah. is... Who does staff that administration? A, because you're going to end up having to pay for a lawyer for the rest of your life. So who takes that gig? Um, but then that eliminates a bunch of good people who might take those gigs. Uh, so that always concerns me, the people who surround him and what that looks like in all departments, because I, he's not a disciplined person. He's not an ideological person who understands that there are limits for the federal government's power. I mean, Liberals are sort of dedicated to the notion that the government has has all, the, has all this power as their ideology. <laughs> Trump's just like, eh, my ideology is me. So if I got something I want to do, I guess I'll just do it. Um, but again, because we're stuck between two bad options, I ha end up having to weigh, like, is he appreciably worse? I, In the end, I don't know. And in the end, I'll probably write somebody in just like I have for the past several presidential elections of my adult life. So... Well, so the thing that I'm curious about from both of you is, you know, I, not to be too like hits blunt, but like, yeah, vindictiveness, <laughs> vengeance is bad. Forgiveness is good, right? Like it is far better to forgive our political opponents uh, for the bad things they have done and to work to reform, to change um, the underlying things that perhaps allowed them to do that, right? Like I think all of us are hugely in favor of reigning in executive power, uh, to the greatest extent possible. And that is a great means of nipping many of these problems in the bud. It's not necessarily a means of doling out retribution, but it is a means of ensuring that these types of problems maybe don't present themselves again. Um, to me, that is preferable and obvious, right? Like that that is the better way to go about this. Um, also, just like a thing that I care about and value in general is like, you should forgive people when they do bad things. I think um, progressives have done a lot of bad things and I'm annoyed by like the capture of elite institutions like universities. Uh, I don't like that, but I don't think that the appropriate way to handle that is to um, attempt to burn them down. I think it's probably to attempt to reform and to forgive people where they have erred. But what does it say about the state of our political discourse that the Bannon type 
diatribe gets so much purchase and so much airtime um or that kevin roberts let that roberts you know the president of the heritage like i know these are prominent people pretty out there for him yeah yeah and and so like what is even if these things don't actually happen even if a trump presidency doesn't necessarily bring this fresh new hell or like should we just be concerned about the words that people on the right use to talk about this type of thing i think there's an appetite I think one of the reasons it gains purchase is because there is so little accountability for actual real bad abuses of power. Let's I, I talked about Russiagate earlier mm-hmm. and the abuses within the intel community and the law enforcement agencies. But then there's the COVID regime, right, which started under Trump and was co- uh, continued under Biden. One of my regrets about uh, Trump getting the nomination of the GOP instead of someone like a DeSantis or someone who is critical of him uh, is that there won't be a conversation about what went wrong during that era because Trump doesn't want to talk about it and Biden doesn't want to talk about it. Um, it feels like so the I think- window, actually, I mean, all three of us are pretty um, COVID radicalized, I would say. Yes. Not to any particular political ideology other than like distrust the authorities, like that type of thing. Uh, are you ready to start a second you- American revolution over yeah, well, it? Well, was- but like also just, I think all of us take the very radical stance of like, maybe don't fill the skate parks with sand and padlock the playgrounds next time around. Like, how about no? Uh, like over my dead body, you'll do that again next time around. Um, but like, it does feel like the window has closed on the COVID reckoning, yeah. right? The COVID reckoning that I think all of us thought would happen. I like, no, we're just not going to do that. Because I think that's inconvenient not... for Trump, right? It's yeah, inconvenient yeah. for both candidates. So it's it's not going to happen. I guess apparently voters didn't care enough about that. Um, and I mean, to echo... Uh, Mary Catherine's point, like the a kind of accountability that I would like to see is a if you let, straight up lie to Congress, how about we actually sanction or punish people? Like that's accountability that I could get behind, even though right. you know I'm not some lock them up type of guy. Like at least some sort of punishment if you perjure yourself in front of Congress about like I don't know. Did you uh, send federal dollars to a laboratory in Wuhan or something like that? Yeah. Um, or mm-hmm. like, do, does the NSA spy on millions of Americans' cell phones? Uh, like, no, nothing ever happens. And then, like, the approach that's happening here with Trump is, well, we need to keep expanding the power to go after the people who wronged us mm-hmm. instead of, oh, Russia Gate. They used FISA courts to spy on us. So. Right. I as Trump and them not going to back a FISA reform bill. I mean, we had Thomas Massey on here uh, on a previous episode, you know, trying to make the case like we're so close. We're so close to uh, getting, you know, Section 702 reformed and uh, like still they can't get it done. And so like that that's the like enduring frustrating thing for me is like these they these structural changes that actually would solve some of the problems that plague the Trump administration don't seem to be front and center. No, I'm with you. Um, I think, unfortunately, particularly when it comes to online crowds and online based voters um, and activists, uh, vengeance is sexy and accountability is not. Uh, But I would make the case, as you say, Liz, both for forgiveness and accountability versus vengeance right because accountability is really good and gives people trust in public functions that they might actually answer to people and they might actually answer when they you know tell you you can't go to a taco stand for two years um you know these are these were large violations of people's civil liberties uh that have not been answered for uh one of my favorite things to do by the way when i was on cnn was to note that both clapper and brennan had lied to congress uh and they were lecturing all of us about public trust uh, one of them was my colleague at the time, so that was not um, yeah. was frowned upon. Uh, but I thought it was important. Which is amazing saying- in itself, by the way, that that kind of revolving door from uh, like being an intelligence official lying to Congress to cable news and back and forth. Um, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, I found, it, I found it problematic for them to yeah. uh, be the ones adjudicating what was trustworthy and what was honest. And I always mentioned it. Um, but yes, I think that without accountability, you end up making vengeance sexier because people want other and particularly i think in the in the right-leaning base there are a lot of people who want a lot more accountability for covid and strangely a lot of them are happy to go along with 
Trump just ignoring it because he had a part in it. Um, but perhaps that's where some of the uh, the appetite for vengeance comes. But I am I am concerned about uh, expanding power to make that happen as opposed to like, hey, let's maybe limit the things we do in order to not have as many tools for hurting people in the future. Well, also, like, what does vengeance even look like? Like, this is kind of the thing that lingers in my head whenever I hear even like a Chris Rufo type person speak where it's a little bit like it feels like dudes talking about like their video game like fantasies or whatever like it's never clear to me like the vengeance that some of these people are describing like okay so you mean a situation where every four years we cycle through putting a different round of political enemies in prison and seems then, like a seems like a bad and, idea and then we do jailbreak and then we just cycle out different people like i'm sorry but like that for forever or are we talking like violence and bloodshed because i don't know that seems uh destabilizing <laughs> Right. Like it's just never quite clear to me. I can understand feeling wronged. I can understand feeling burned, but I don't necessarily understand wanting to channel that into um, like imprisonment and destruction to the degree that many of these people seem to fantasize about. Well, I guess that sort of that sort of brings us full circle, which is that even though I disagree with things in the Mandate for Leadership Project 2025, uh, talking through those policies for what accountability might look like for how you prevent COVID lies from happening again, from how you prevent intel uh, agencies from exploiting their positions uh, in the future. Talking through that and having people who thought about policy for it, even with you, if you disagree with it, uh, is a better result than either not talking about it at all or just scaring the crap out of people about what it, are ideas written on a sheet of paper that you are welcome to disagree with, Right. Um, that's the part that gets me is I feel like this, when this, um, emotionalism of cable news gets ratcheted up to this degree, we're not talking about anything. And I do feel like no matter how bad project 2025 might be, it's not what Joy Reid is making it right. Like, and, and in that space, we're not having a conversation about that how we might actually improve. Yeah, uh, it's not what Joy Reid is making. It seems like an evergreen truth. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but like, uh, the, the, there's, um, I want to bring this home by talking about like the current state of the race. Obviously, Biden has a commanding lead uh, in, I, I'm sorry, uh, Trump had, I just had a, a Biden brain there. Uh, Trump has a commanding lead um, in every swing state, uh, according to most polls, um, nationally, he's ahead by, I think almost four points. Um, it's Trump's race to lose. Is there anything that can make him lose it at this point? I mean, he can make him lose it for sure. Um, that would be my number one thing on the list. However, right now he seems to be governing himself in a way that he has not been capable of very often in the past. Um, you know, I think even though this political moment feels very unstable, uh, I don't know what's going to happen with the Biden campaign. It is important that that debate happened. And it is important that people saw uh, the condition of the president. It concerns me about what's going on at the head of the government right now, speaking of executive power. But what also I think is really important is that that cheap fakes argument from media, yeah. which was going to be joined by academia, telling you how cheap fakes were, you know, they were going to have all these think pieces about it. Disinformation and experts, all, Ben Collins is going to All the experts all were going to get involved. Yeah. And we were going to have yet another sort of amorphous term, like disinformation, misinformation, whatever it is, turned news. into a way to have the government force social media to crack down on American people having a discussion about videos they can see with their own eyeballs. Um, and so I'm so glad that that attempt was blown up because I think that was the disinfo of this election is that they needed something for video and cheap fakes was their word. And we were about to be a, just inundated with so many panels about the cheap fakes uh, and how we needed to stop sharing things online. And so I'm glad we've avoided that uh, just at this moment in time, whatever it means for the political uh, landscape, that that particular assault on free speech did not work out for them. Um, I don't know that lessons will be learned from that, but I hope they will. Um, Biden is not a candidate that I think is capable of turning around an election. So I think this is Trump's to lose. Luckily for Biden, he is capable of doing that. 
So that's where we are right now. But I, I do think a lot of people look at the four years under Trump and the four years under Biden and they go, well, the pitch was for normalcy and that sure didn't feel normal. So if I'm getting crazy either way, maybe I'll take the less inflation with a crazy dude at the top. Fair enough. Well, we want to uh, ask you, we ask all of our guests one question at the end of the show, which is in the spirit of the show, what is a question that you, Mary Catherine Ham, think that more people should be asking? Oh my gosh. Um, I think my question is what we uh, touched on earlier, which is why don't more people care about COVID accountability? And one of the most aggressive assaults on daily civil liberties, uh, certainly in my living memory, uh, for a sustained period of time. Uh, I understand it was traumatic, but uh, if the retribution politically amounts to Glenn Youngkin being governor of Virginia, it ain't enough. And I appreciate all the people doing, uh, there, there are small yeah. wins with people yeah. doing lawsuits over their employment, and they are winning a lot of those, and I appreciate those people doing that. But uh, I think that would be the question that I would like solved. Why aren't people more mad about that? That I think that's a question everyone in the show can get behind. Um, you can see uh, Mary Catherine Hamm on Fox News, her podcast, Hammer Time. Any other uh, places that we should um, point people to? At MK Hammer on Twitter, at MK Hammer Time on Instagram, and it's getting hammered for the podcast. <laughs> Perfect. It's all uh, hammered. <laughs> Mary Catherine Hand, thanks for talking to us. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.